Is everybody happy? Yay. Yay! Thank you for the pizza. Those who missed the pizza, we still got some outside. If someone wants to take it home, they can do it. Cool. Not you, Ward. He needs help. Yeah, he does. Okay, this is the October uh, safety meeting for the Marchero Club, and uh, welcome. I'm Roger Mann, the safety officer. Uh, Pizza. He just left. <laughs> oh, he's, he's that hungry? Okay. Uh, and Bob Pierce is the Aero Club manager. We have John Law sitting over there with the sunglasses, uh, who's uh, cool, really cool. And he's our chief pilot. And let's see, who else do we have in here? That's, you know, none of the other instructors showed up. I don't see him. Anymore. Jerry's here somewhere. Yeah, Jerry's here. Oh, there's Jerry. Why are you sitting way back there? Good class. Oh, gee. <laughs> and I forgot to tell you to wear your sunglasses today. Uh, okay, and then, of course, we've got uh, safety, uh, wing uh, visor, uh, 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 Bill. <laughs> <laughs> it went right on my head. Bill. <laughs> and uh, let's see, who else do we have in here? I know we were supposed to have a maintenance uh, guy in here. Well, yeah. Yeah, we don't count. Yeah, we don't. Those guys don't count. We, were, we have the wing safety, or the wing maintenance guy, and I don't know if we have the ops uh, officer in here or not from operations. I don't see him. So it looks like safety does it again. They're the only one that shows up. Uh, well, he said he was going to be here. Yeah, I know he did say that. Captain T. Yeah. Well, anyhow. Uh, so, welcome to the Aero Club. And, uh, all right, it does work. October 13, and we do have an agenda. Okay, one of the first things that we do is that we uh, um, introduce new people. Uh, anybody who's new in the club, uh, within the last, you know, reasonable period of time, especially since the last safety meeting, who's here, please stand up. Introduce yourself. It's just me. Yep. Uh, I'm, Jeff, I'm Jeff Kemp. Uh, I work here on base uh, in the 336 airfield and squadron. I'm just starting out. I just signed up uh, last week or so. Uh, yeah. Uh, trying to get my private pilot's license and eventually uh, hopefully be able to take a pilot with the 336 and that's my goal here. Nice. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Don't be afraid. That's why I had you stand up. So yeah, know, these guys don't attack. <laughs> They're just typical pilots, you know, both Air Force and civilian. So, uh, okay. Well, is there anybody else that hasn't? I don't know. Do I know you? Yeah, you. Good. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, you've been here before. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Okay. Um, okay. Has anybody just got a new pilot rating? I want to thank Jerry and John for putting up with me for almost a year and trying to get me through this. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Congratulations. Well, I yeah. did it on Sunday. <clears throat> on Sunday, yes. And we were really rooting for you. Uh, we got another guy standing in the corner. Hasn't quite made it yet, but he's going to here real soon. And how was your check ride? Was it uh, what you expected or was it harder than you thought? He's got whip marks on his back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my head still bruised from John beating me with a two-by-four. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't believe that. Yeah. The, uh, now the check ride went fine. Yeah. Uh, really no issues. It was actually a little easier than I thought. Yeah. Most of the time, the check ride's easier than what your instructor has been doing to you. So, you know, for the most part. And also, too, can, we, can you do us a favor and try to remember what you were asked? Because uh, we have a read file for those of you guys that don't know over by the fax machine where you can write 
down all the different questions that you're asked, what did he do, what the examiner did with you, and that type of stuff as a kind of a little thing to help out any future students who want to come in and, you know, get, get a Well, get since a I had to do it twice, pretty much everything in the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, so right now, you are the most knowledgeable pilot we have in the Aero Club. Okay. So there he is, guys. If you have any questions, there he is. He can probably answer all of them. <laughs> Just ask again. Just, yeah, exactly. Okay, has anybody else done anything? This includes Air Force. You know, no. Got furloughed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's okay, that's good. Safety. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Lost a lot of missions. Lost a lot of missions, yeah. I heard about that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so... Nothing else like, you know. UTA is uh, canceled for next week. Yeah. UTA not for us. Not for you? Yeah. Not for us. Well, that's good. That's good. Is this still going? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not essentials. Bob, is EPA gone too? No, they're, they're rescheduling it for some of the people on base. Uh, okay, any experiences? Anything that anybody can tell us that thrills everybody? And whatever you do, don't say, talk about those things that might scare away a student. But, uh, you know, anything that's happened to you, you know, that you need. I know George oftentimes has stories. Again, that includes you guys in the Air Force, too. That's anything. It doesn't have to be just Aero Club airplanes. Even airlines. Mike? I'm not flying, so it's safe. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Gosh, nobody has had anything exciting happen, huh? We had a good flight the Friday out of here up to Santa Maria. Well, I was going to say, you know, Ken here, you know, you I chickened out. Fly. You, you chickened out and decided not I'd, to fly. I had work to do. I couldn't be late. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I know you were running around all over the place, so you didn't have to wear the uniform, did you? I wore a Sunday morning. <laughs> uh, kind of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so well, okay. One guy has experience. He has license. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Danny's the only one in here I know has had the most exciting week of all. Well, the what? <laughs> Come on, I know you guys have had things. I saw the Reno Air Races. Well, you did see the Reno Air Races. How many guys did go to the Reno Air Races here? Yeah, I know that a couple of you guys have done so. Yeah, but that guy right there. Of course, you know, he's got, a, he's got, what is it, he's got people in high places, he knows, yeah. Well, okay, uh, we're going to talk to the Aero Club manager in a few minutes, then we're going to go into real quick, know your SOPs, and then we're going to go into, are you a shady pilot? Okay, Aero Club manager. I just, want, I just want to cover uh, one item first before I get started, and that is, I was reading the Bonanza book, and can anybody tell me where most accidents take place in GA aircraft, how many hours the individual has? Are we looking at low hours? Are we looking at a lot of high time hours? How many people think it's around high time? Eight, nine thousand hours more? How about, the, how many people think at the lower end? Well, 200 to 500. Yeah. Actually, there's more accidents between 100 and 200 hours after an individual gets a private pilot's license than in any other prospective area. And that's statistical. They got it on the books. So people get their license, the next thing you know, they're trying to, it's just like Roger, uh, uh, or actually I should say that uh, uh, Ken did at the Civil Air Patrol, coming up with an ATC individual who thought he was, and talked like he had a lot of experience, had his uh, sister with him who was a pilot, and ended up killing both of them because they got into some IFR weather, had no approach plates, and the approach controller thought that he had experience only because he was good on the microphone. 
So just be aware, 100 to 200 hours is probably the most dangerous time for you. Uh, a couple times here, real quick, uh, hobs meter. Guys, don't forget, we're finding some errors in the hobs. The T34 is a real hard to read, but that's where we're finding the errors, so don't forget, get down there, get your eyes real close to it, use the magnifying glass, and round up. Find out which way that meter runs. You can talk to David G. He'll tell you whether it's backwards or forwards, up or down. Even uh, even Wes can help you out on that. But uh, we're finding errors on the hops, and then therefore people are showing up with a tenth of an hour, and some of the people are getting a little bit tired of, of paying for your previous flight. So just try and clean it up. Uh, cleaning. Don't forget the nose gear box, that's why they're painted white. You need to get, get in there and wipe them out. Uh, even though we've got some decent engines, uh, now in 5.6, we still have a leak in 5.6. Uh, that's why we're not going to send the engines back to that company anymore. They seem to be uh, prone to that. Uh, 5.3 and getting into maintenance. Uh, it's got a cracked cylinder, so the engine's being pulled out. And as soon as I can get uh, an okay to spend 360 or $346, we'll have the engine at Park set to us. But everything I have for parts and everything is on hold by my manager. Well, that person thinks about it. In the meantime, in another week, five, six will be down, and now we're down to no airplanes for rentals. So I don't know how we can make money when we're trying to make money when my manager is saying she'll think about it. Uh, Signing of the credit card slip. People are beginning to sign the credit card slip, but they're not running their credit card through the machine. Okay, so that's that's kind of neat. Uh, and there's no there's no numbers on it. They just kind of sign it. No, you got to put the thing in the machine and then get the paper started with the roller, run it across, pull it back out, and you really don't have to take and write the credit card number on the slip if you put the credit card number and let the machine do it and emboss it on the paper. So we have one person that continually writes on that, and we're not really supposed to do that. Sometimes people that come out in audits don't like that. So put the card in there. And then the next thing that we have uh, an issue with on the credit card, what does the authorization box mean? Most people who are using a lot of credit cards, we put something in the authorization box, and below that is... Um, reference number. Reference number, thank you. And that's where the invoice number goes on. So what's in the authorization number? Code. The code on the back of your card. The three-digit code. We can't run a credit card unless you got the three-digit code. So that creates a problem for Roger. And it's not helping <coughs> us out much. So double-check it. Instructors, it's your responsibility on new students to ensure that you explain to them how to fill out the credit card slip. We do have a little... Uh, gouge up there. If you need help, ask Roger or ask me. We'll be more than happy to come out and show you what you should be doing so you get used to doing that for the future. And that's going to save us a lot of time. Saves Roger a lot of time because then he tries to get in the computer to find out what the code is. And some people, because they pay by check, don't have a credit card slip in, in, the, uh, in the dues program. So that's going to help us out. Is there so a let's take a why we don't have the Swipe machine working so you don't have to worry with all that crap? Because we're not here all the time. Yeah, but you were here today and it wasn't up and running, so I had to run across. Well, there's, there's well, issues. Well, no, I, I did not. So I don't have it running every day. Just because I'm there, I don't always have it running. I but, ran but, it later but on. It eliminates errors. If you have that up, you, you eliminate but there's, errors. There's also issues about time frames and how we have to take and submit that to account and submit that information in to be for deposit. So we try and do it every other day because Roger doesn't have that amount of time to take and do it. So it's easier in some cases just to take and run the credit card. If he's going to take and make a deposit and it's late in the afternoon, he's going to do it in the morning, he will take and run that credit card slip through the machine. So there are pros and cons because of his workload. And you have to understand, he's, he's just a one-man army. And so you've got to give him help as much as you can. So try, just try and help him out with their slip. But yeah, it is easier to run that thing. But it's a whole lot issues. easier on me. I wish I could ju just run it for you, but I th today I had no idea if I was going to be able to run all those thirty or forty credit cards I had to run today and get done in time before the end of the day. But I, and it kind of turned out that I could do that, but I don't know that at the time. 
because there's dues run today. See, the day is due, was dues run day, which that's, was uh, 130 the the something odd people. By manual now. Before we used to just do a one click. You know, it's kind of like in uh, you want to send a, a mass email. You do one click on the flight schedule pro, and the checks just keep on going. You go down and delete this person, this person, this person. We don't have that option anymore. They've changed a lot of the accounting. It's become a real, a real strong issue for us of uh, making things very simple. So just bear with us. Uh, let's, let's take a review of the airplanes. Uh, 29 Foxtrot. Uh, we're trying to get the, uh, the authorization uh, with the purchase request to get the altimeter pulled and have that overhauled. And then when that's overhauled and we get it back, then we get the 182 and 29 Foxtrot over to Chino for the PDOT static check. We'll complete the PDOT static for 29. Both of those aircraft then will be certified for night flight. Uh, and right now, only 15 Foxtrot is certified for night flight. 182 is still good right now. It's Pardon? 182, I think, is still good. To expand. It's still good to the end of the month. Right. It's still good to the end of the month, yes. Uh, 29 Foxtrot is not good. I mean, that's why when you go in there and you can't check it out, it says that the PDOT static is deleted. No, you can still fly at VFR. We have to go in there and fudge on the, on the date. Uh, 234 Whiskey Papa. Uh, the aircraft. Uh, has everything basically done. It's been run up and down the runway. Uh, if we really can need it, uh, they can send it back to us or we can go pick it up. But I'm asking for $4,000 more to complete some additional wiring and some minor things so we can get it home. Uh, right now I've been told you have to wait till the <coughs> next, next console for that, so my viewpoint it stays there until we get the additional money that we owe. 555, uh, I've submitted all that material for the wing. We're waiting for the contract. 57, um, submitted that uh, information as a uh, sole source. We're going to go to Tim's Aircraft Engines in Long Beach. Um, that's where we're going to send it. It's a few thousand dollars more, but he can produce an engine for us in four weeks, and he guarantees all his work. And everybody I know that's got Tim's engine have been very happy without any problems, including oil leaks. So the only thing we've got left is 53. And that engine's in uh, uh, Earl Parks. As soon as we get shipped out here and work on the oil pump, uh, we'll get that installed. It's over at Flay Bob now. And uh, they say they can get it installed within three days and get it up for a <coughs> test run. So that's what we're hoping for. Are you and taking 5-6 then over to? 5-6? No, 5-6 we'll do here. 5-6 we'll do here. 5-6 uh, is down to about... Uh, how much time did you put on today, Richard? 100, you said. One hour? Two hours? We hour put one, we put 0. 0.9 on it. Oh, only 0. 0.9 for both of you guys? Yeah. We checked really? when we came in. It was 9.2. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And then looking at my schedule for the month uh, will give us a, a couple hours. So if you want to fly 5-6, be sure and call the office so I can look on the master sheet and see in scheduling what, what amount of time we have left. By the end of the month, that's going to be down for an annual. John and I want to fly it for an hour, uh, Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. Okay, I'll make room for you. I'll make room. Because I'm canceling the... Uh, Malcolm for the 25th or 26th that Saturday. I'm scheduled tomorrow. You're on the schedule for 1.3, I think I got you down. Ballpark figure. So I'm really looking at it real close so that we can make sure that everybody's there. And it'll be down for what, two weeks then, David? Ideally, maybe? Uh, about two weeks, yeah. Yeah, so that's going to be on there. So I need uh, Jerry. <coughs> You said you need one hour? One, one, yeah, one hour. One hour, John? Just one hour? Okay. <coughs> I'll get you in. Okay, any questions on maintenance and everything? Thank you. Um, one thing about the credit cards, bring that up. Um, they're coming out now with these new credit cards that do not have the raised numbers any, anymore. Uh, and there's are a couple of people in the club that have those. When you write your number down on the credit card slip, 
where it says do not write, that's where you write it. <laughs> okay, I've had two people keep writing down below the line. No, that do not write means that's where your credit card number goes. That's why it says do not write here. <laughs> so that's where your credit card number goes, right across the very top. So when it, with and when you do get one of those credit cards, just go ahead and just, you know, do it manually. That's what you're going to have to do. <clears throat> okay. Um, just to recap just a little bit, for those of you that don't know yet, uh, we do have a YouTube video. And uh, uh, you can watch this meeting on the YouTube as long as my camera people can get it on there in a timely manner. And uh, once it gets on there, you can watch it, but in order to get credit for the YouTube video that you watched, you have to take a little exam, which we have in the office. And of course, if you're coming out to fly, obviously you're going to be there to take that exam. Uh, that's just so that it, it, the Air Force, when they come with their inspection, that's going to be one of the first things they're going to ask. How do you know the person watched it? Well, here's the exam that they take. I mean, so. it's a short exam. It's only 100 questions, so you should be <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and they're really, really, really hard. So. Um, that actually, no. There are ten questions, and they're very, very easy, and it's the contents of what the safety meeting's about. Uh, so uh, if you do come in and watch it just on the video there in the office while we're there or the clearing officials there or whatever, then, you know, you, you just do it just like you used to do it, same old way. Uh, you can even watch the YouTube video right there on our computer if you want, if the computer doesn't crash. Which, incidentally, that reminds me, that computer has been doing a lot of crashing lately. Um, we're trying to get it fixed. Um, our computer guru, who's in the Aero Club, that usually shows up to the safety meetings, isn't here tonight, so I can't tack him tonight. So we're trying to get that computer sort of, well, you know, doesn't crash as much. Uh, right now, talking about buying another computer, <laughs> <laughs> is kind of a tricky little uh, thing that may not happen, especially since we can't even get parts for the airplanes. So uh, we're kind of in between a rock and a hard place. <clears throat> Any questions on this? Okay, and know your SOPs. Basically what this SOP, what we're talking about tonight is uh, Chapter 5, safety, still under safety, and, and it's a continuation of what we had last time, uh, or the time before. Uh, bird, uh, aircraft strikes, uh, hazards, a bash program, and basically what it is is just a program where, where they keep track of what you hit. Uh, we do have a bird strike kit that's in the office and it's over by the drinking fountain so if you ever do hit a bird they do want you to get a sample of that bird into that kit. The instructions for it and everything is all in the kit. It's all right there and uh, uh, it's one of those things where you know you don't just blow it off and of course don't blow it off and see what kind of damage. If there is any damage to the airplane now you, now we're going to have to uh, talk about that. But uh, if it's just like, you know, where you hit a bird and, and anything like that happens, uh, you please get a sample of it. Uh, if the first strike is here at March, is the contact, get a hold of the contractor, and she'll come all out and help you get the, uh, get the sample of that. Yeah. She can't access the C-17s and the 135s in the restricted area, but she can come up to your airport. Up the Aero Club, yeah. Yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good point. And I do have her, her card there in the office, so uh, if you need to call her, or we can call her too, of course. Can you put that information with the kit so it's right there for us? Actually, uh, actually if, if nobody's in the office, all you got to do is call operations. When you call down for your flight plan, tell them you need the bird lady to come out, you got a bird strike, you need a sample, they will call her. So the 4404, 655-4404 gives you base ops, and they can do that. And I'll, you know, and actually I can put one of the cards in that kit, too. Uh, that, and it's just right in there on my desk, too. And uh, anything else, Bill, that I could miss in there? 
Okay, let's move on. Okay, this is why I want everybody to come with sunglasses. I was going to try to get all the instructors to do it, but then things started going nuts, and I wanted everybody to come in just like that. That, that picture right there. Uh, he's a commander. Yeah, yeah, he's he. Well, he's the captain, isn't he? He's the big shot. I know, and I wanted, I wanted Jay to be here because if there's anybody that looks good in sunglasses, it's Jay. <laughs> but then Jay doesn't come tonight. So <laughs> I was trying to get one of some of those sunglasses, big joke ones, that were like about this big. I was going to come up here wearing those things. But they don't sell those things anywhere anymore. They don't, you know, that's a, my wife said, yeah, it's a different generation, so they don't do that anymore. you got to go to Disneyland. Disneyland, yeah, maybe. I don't think I've even seen them there, though. So, what we are talking about tonight, it's, it, this is right out of the FAA safety program. And why do we wear sunglasses? I know for some people it's, you know, so we can look cool. Yeah. It attracts the girls. Yeah, it does that too. Yeah. Uh, I can sleep at the controls without the passengers noticing. How many have done that? Well, I know Bob has. Okay, now Ken, yeah, it's modest people. Uh, I know in the Air Force plane the pilot can do that when the passengers come up front to look, you know, and everything. Sit over there with your sunglasses and <coughs> really sleep. Right? No, not not, not even more the eyeballs on There's, there's, well, no, more, there's yeah. no more engineers to stay awake now. I know. That's, <coughs> yeah, well, see, that's no more engineers. That just got, yeah, we, see, we used to wake you up. With, with, hey, they're coming up. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, let's see. I can look like I know what I'm doing, but not have a clue. Um, I can look like I know what I'm doing during a flight checkout. Of course, the examiner is doing the same thing. Both don't know what they're doing. However, or maybe it's both examiner, instructor, and pilot just simply know what they are doing and show it by wearing those cool-looking glasses. Uh, and maybe a little skill is involved in that, too. However, for most of us know that there's a more practical purpose behind it. Um, <coughs> We always are always concerned about it, and I know like in the Air Force, one of the big things, you know, is your eyesight, and Air Force always wants to have, you know, that perfect vision, especially if you first go to pilot training, and then after you come back from pilot training, then your eyes can start deteriorating and nobody seems to care. Uh, actually, that's not totally true, but they, they you know, the FAA has always been a lot le less stringent in, in their uh, eyesight restrictions than like the military. Military, you know, because of the type of airplanes you fly, they want you to have good vision. Uh, in general aviation, however, you know, you, they just want you to be able to see, you know, and uh, obviously there's a certain point where it gets, you know, where even the FAA goes, okay, you can't fly anymore. Um, there is an individual that we know that Bob and I know pretty well, and I think some of you guys know him too, uh, who started getting the, what was it called? It was, uh, from uh, the, the degener gen <laughs> degeneration in his eyeballs, he can still fly as an instructor, just like uh, Fred can, but, uh, but he cannot fly as a pilot in command anymore. And, uh, it's, you know, your eyesight's very important, and so we try to do everything we can, we can to take care of our eyesight. And, uh, and you know, we, we, I know that like whenever you run machinery, they always like you to wear some kind of protection for your eyes. And, uh, but when you're flying in an airplane, uh, it's just like running a machine or something like that. You should try to take care of your eyes there. Um, The practical side of sunglasses is to protect the pilot's eyes from glare associated with bright sunlight and harmful effects from exposure of solar radiation. Um, the Earth pretty much shelters us from solar radiation, and uh, and I'll show you a few minutes here of the uh, spectrum. 
the colors probably won't come out real well on this screen is this projector is all messed up but uh, um, but it's you're during the day when you're flying in an airplane and especially when you're flying at super high altitudes like the Air Force guys do uh, you know you get all these different variations of infrared that can mess up your eyes pretty bad um, the ultraviolets uh, are everywhere but being down here on the earth we kind of have a shelter between you know where it's coming from and down down into our eyes as you start climbing up an airplane even eight eight nine thousand feet in our airplanes you know it can still be a, a problem so like down here at the bottom of the statement down there it says uh, exposure to ultraviolet radiation increases by approximately five percent for every thousand feet of altitude so uh, that's some, you know, that's stuff that you need to kind of take in consideration. Um, what we're talking about tonight is kind of basically what type of lenses you might want to be looking for. And uh, this is just a real quick and dirty thing that goes through just kind of giving you an idea as guidance. At the end of the slides here tonight, I will give you the source of all of this and where you can find out in more detail. Uh, we all go out and we buy sunglasses, but sometimes we don't buy the right sunglasses. Basically, what we've got up here is you've got the spectrum, and everything over here on the right-hand side, that's where you feel the heat from the sun. But for the most part, that doesn't really do any much damage to your eyes or to the skin or anything like that. At least it's thought of that. The other arrow down there on the other end, that's the part that's really dangerous. This part down here that's down at the bottom is a blow up of this area right here. These are the three areas that are the, that of the wavelengths which really do the damage. And you've got your UVA, uh, ultraviolet A, ultraviolet B, and then ultraviolet C. Ultraviolet C is the most dangerous. However, ultraviolet C, for the most part, is stopped by the ozone layer. Now, of course, the, one of the things that they're concerned about is, you know, if the deterioration of the ozone layer might be, you know, uh, if it is deteriorating, then that might be allowing some of that stuff through. Uh, the other two, UVB and UVA, they do come through, and those are the things that you need to be uh, trying to protect your eyes from. The American Optometric yeah. Optometric Association recommends wearing sunglasses uh, or incorporate 99 to 100 percent UVA and UVB. There are three types of lenses that you can buy. There's crown glass, monomer plastic, and polycarbonate plastic. Crown glass, it provides an excellent optical property. Uh, it's glass. Uh, crown glass is a more scratch resistant, but of course they're heavier. Uh, glass does absorb some UV light, but absorption is improved by adding certain chemicals. And we'll get into that real quick here in a couple of minutes. Uh, most of the glasses you get from the store have been coated with chemicals. That's what usually does the job. Uh, glass retains its tints best, so if you get like you like the, those tints where where you can't hardly see anything, which we'll cover that real quick too. Uh, <clears throat> glass, of course, retains those tints better. Uh, correction, the color may be less uniform because glass tends to be not as uniform all the way across. And as that picture down there where I got the arrow pointing, you can see that sometimes it can be kind of do that. It can, you know, you may have your dark glasses where sometimes it'll be thicker in some areas and thinner in others. And it doesn't, it's not uniform. Let's see. And, okay, plastic lenses. This is probably more likely what everybody gets. 
Uh, CR 39, which is a registered uh, uh, item, which you can see up there, lenses possess excellent optical qualities and are lighter in weight and more impact resistant than glass. Easily scratched, however, as many of you, especially if you have a helmet bag or you got to put in your flight suit and you kind of go like this, it's, uh, it can scratch. So what they do is they put these SRC or scratch resistant coatings on them to try to help keep them from being scratched so easy. Uh, they also tint easily and uniformly, unlike glass. Uh, the, even when, they, when you've got a great deal of refractive correction, which means that, in other words, you can't, you're blind, you can't see much. Uh, but do not hold the tints as well as glass, though. Uh, plastic can be bleached and retinted if fading becomes excessive. Uh, how many here have gotten really super expensive uh, gla dark glasses? I had a friend of mine that bought some uh, Hereta. Do you remember him? Yeah. He, he bought over Hawaii yeah, this $500 glasses. <laughs> uh, I mean, they, it was like, and I mean, you look at them, they were absolutely, seemed perfect. I mean, they, you look for them, they're great, you know? I don't know how long they lasted, but uh, <laughs> you can spend a lot of money on dark glasses. Okay, and then you got polycarbonate plastic. Uh, they're lighter than the previous one that we just saw, than the uh, CR39, and most impacted resistant lenses available. Uh, polycarbonate has a low Abbey value. I will get to that in a second before you ask the question. Uh, indicating their inherent optical, uh, um, optical abrasion. Uh, the, the application of the anti-reflective coat can approve, which is a coat that they put, again, it's another chemical they put on the glass that, key, that, that helps it so that it doesn't have this reflection to it. Uh, like when you look in your glasses, you get this reflective uh, where it doesn't really help. Um, these lenses have built-in ultraviolet protection and are manufactured with a scratch-resistant coating that is much stronger than the, than the CR39 lenses. Since polycarbonate lenses do not accept dye as readily as CR39 plaid, they are less adaptable for use as sunglasses. However, the interior anti-scratch coating will absorb the tents. Those are the three main ones. Uh, up here you got the lens properties and basically, real quick, whenever you go into a store or go into your doctor or eye doctor or whatever, the things you want to be paying attention to are some of these things like these numbers right up here. You, got, you have these three up here, but then you have the index of refraction and one that I was showing, let's see, specific gravity, you don't really much, you know, that's something else. Dispersion, that's another thing you want to be paying attention to. And these things, these numbers up here, right now don't really mean anything, but this thing I was talking to you about called the Abbey value. The Abbey value is one of these things that's really kind of complicated, how it's very easy to explain. Uh, Chromatic aberration is when white light diffuses. <clears throat> when it diffuses, it starts putting little colors around the outside. Okay, your eye usually won't pick up the different colors, but what it will pick up is the blurriness. In other words, it will look blurred <coughs> to you. And that's where those values come up over here. Your <coughs> that one right there in the middle, the higher the number, let me make sure I get this correct, I don't want to say it, but the highest Abbey number uh, has the most aberration, yeah, the highest one has the least aberration, the lower number has the most aberration. In other words, it's going to cause more of that blurriness. So, Whenever you look at these things, that's why I say you want, there's no way you're going to say or memorize this, but you can get this from the FDA <coughs> and, and also from your doctor too. Because a lot of this stuff I got 
offline and just went and looked it up. And it's absolutely fascinating. It really is fascinating what goes into sunglasses or regular glasses. Just absolutely amazing. But those are the numbers that basically they look at. And of course, up there at the very top line plays into that same picture. And so you're, you're running out. Uh oh. That's my, that's the thing that's going to see if I can talk or not. Uh, the, the upper line up there, the index of refraction, the, the higher number equals thinner glass. So in other words, when you start getting lenses that are trying to get lighter and thinner, the problem is, is that the average number starts getting lower, and so you get more blurriness. <coughs> so those are those kind of things that you have to be looking at. Without getting into all this technical stuff, they are things that you do need, especially if you're going to spend any amount of money to buy these things. Um, high index materials, okay, that's, that is, the high index uh, glasses are the ones where they, uh, for people who have, uh, you know, can't see real well. In other words, you have a real problem with distance or closeness. And what they try to do is try to make the glasses so that they're thinner. Uh, back in the old days, you had glasses that were this thick. Uh, for a while, the, those of you who know Fred, he wore glasses that were really super thick. Uh, and what they are trying to do is get away from that. And what they do is they have these high, high index uh, materials where they can make glasses that are thinner and can still do the same thing. Um, the high index materials are not widely available as much as like the other ones because obviously if your eyes are really bad, uh, I suppose there's a curve in our society that has that. Require, but they do require um, uh, abrasive resistant coats. They also require the scratch resistant coatings and all that kind of stuff in order for them to work well. Is everybody keeping up? Is there anybody still awake? <laughs> yeah. We are going to get down to the practical end of it. What are the coatings? These coatings are previously mentioned are applied to the lenses. Uh, crown glasses and most plastic lenses require uh, coatings to block the ultraviolet radiation. Plastic and carbonated need to have the scratch resistant because obviously they're plastic. Uh, the um, <coughs> the uh, AR coats improve transmiss transmissivity due to high reflective properties. Bar porous and they also track, you know, how you can't, you try to clean your glasses and you can't seem to clean them. Well, that's the problem with, the, with those coatings on those glasses. Tents, okay, this is where you get the people who come out there and they, their glasses are so blasted dark that you can't see anything. They can't see anything. You can't see their eyes, you, they can't even see you. Um, the choice for tents, for sunglasses, for flying airplanes, there are three common, which is gray, gray, green, and brown, with any of which would be excellent choice for flying. Gray neutral density filter is recommended, however, because it distorts the color the least. Can anybody think why you would want the color to not be distorted while you're flying an airplane? Your glass. Instrumentation. Instrumentation. Charts. Charts. Looking at airplanes coming from the other direction. Red light, green light. Probably won't affect that as much, but it would definitely affect possibly charts. How many here have flown at night and have looked at a chart? And <laughs> red light with yeah. sunglasses on? <laughs> How about a red light or any yeah, of that kind almost of Almost impossible. It, it's, yeah. Daytime, when you're wearing your sunglasses. Oh, by the way, I've known people to wear their sunglasses at night. I could name them off, too, but I won't. Um, yellow, amber, and orange blue blockers eliminate short wavelength light from re reaching the wearer's eyes. However, according to the science, to the studies, this has never been proven. But apparently there's some people out there that seem to think that's a true statement up there. Uh, these tints are known to distort colors, however. 
making it difficult to distinguish cover, navigation lights, just as, just as we talked about. For flying sunglasses, lenses should screen out 70-85% of visible light, not appreciably. Tents that block more than 85% of visible light are not recommended for flying, period. Like I said, this is all from the FAA. Polarized glass. How many have polarized sunglasses? FAA says no. Uh, they says it is not recommended. And I, I found that out one time when I had some polarized sunglasses and I was driving this uh, truck uh, for somebody, some pickup truck. And it was weird. I, I, I went like this and I looked out the window and everything just turned dark. I, it was the weirdest thing. I went, whoa! whoa. <laughs> it was weird, and it was the interaction between what was on his windshield and that truck and my polarized glasses. It was the weirdest thing in the world. It can do the same thing on an airplane. And uh, I know that some airplanes, the glass, it's on the instrumentation sometimes. If you look at it, if you have polarized glasses, I have seen it. And, and, and it has a color tint to it. It's, it's weird. So FAA just basically says, just don't use polarized glasses. Photochromatic, how many have these kind of glasses here? Yeah, those are the ones that turn color or turn dark when you go outside and when you come inside they turn light. Uh -huh. I know CHP would definitely have those. So yeah, it's, uh, the, it, it's, they're good glasses, and they can turn all the way down like regular sunglasses. Uh, but the problem is they're they limited in their ability to darken and reduce ultraviolet exposure in the cockpit. Uh, at least that's according to their studies. Uh, they can also limit their effectiveness. So that's the only thing you got to be thinking about if you have those type of sunglasses. Frames. A short note. Basically, I just threw up here, how many of you have worn sunglasses or any kind of glasses and find that sometimes it doesn't seal right? Yeah, you want to take that in consideration sometimes. And, you know, when you go to an eye doctor, you know, you, you, you pick out your frames and all that kind of stuff. And that's just one of the things you want to be thinking about. And, of course, it depends on your headset, too. So there's a lot of factors involved. But it's some of the things that you want to be thinking about and... Uh, it's, it, it, it's something that's, uh, you know, you don't think too much about it. And it's funny because when I was looking uh, for a safety meeting, one of the things when I ran across this is it, 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 I, I saw this uh, under the FAA safety, uh, part, of, part of the FAA safety thing, and, and I saw that and I went, oh my goodness, you're kidding, you know, because how many times do we really think about it? I mean, there's, I often wonder, and even the FAA has mentioned, you know, that sometimes, what about that time when you're flying in the traffic pattern and you are wearing some kind of glasses that don't pick up that other airplane shininess or the wing or something that distorts and you don't see it and they run into each other. Uh, it is a possibility. and. Uh, it, it, but you should wear sunglasses, though, because when you anytime you go up in an airplane, and especially the T-34s, I mean, you don't have any protection there. Summary. We wear sunglasses to protect our eyes. Lenses for sunglasses that are incorporated 100% <coughs> protection are available in glass, plastic, and polycarbonate materials. Glass and CR39 plastic lenses have a superior optical qualities, while polycarbonate lenses are lighter and more impact resistant. Tents for use in aviation environments should be limited to those that optimize visual performance while minimizing color distortion, such as neutral gray tent and 15 to 30 percent light transmittance. Polarized sunglasses, again, is not recommended. 
the technology associated with the Athama, <laughs> yes, right. That was easy for me to say. Uh, yes, that lenses is continually evolving, and the introduction of new materials are coming out on a regular basis. Some of this stuff that when I first started flying was not heard of at all back when I first started going. So they're coming out with more and more and more things. Uh, you guys as pilots should consult your eye care mm -hmm. practitioner. For those of you who wear regular glasses, you should do that. I know the Air Force guys have to go see the eye doctor no matter what. Every single year you got to see the eye doctor. Um, for the rest of you that don't wear glasses and don't go see a regular eye doctor, at least you know you do see the uh, FAA doctor. and. Uh, you know, you might want to ask them about some of these things. Uh, it's something that's, uh, it, it is very important. Uh, down at the bottom down there, for those of you that want to write it down, there's the FAA publication. This is where all this came from, uh, AM 400-5-1. And also the FAA Civil Aer uh, Aerospace Med uh, Medical Institute. Any questions? Any doubts? Next meeting's 19 November. Thanksgiving comes at the last week of the month. So this is still a week, a little over a week before Thanksgiving. <coughs> Normally we have a conflict oftentimes and have it the same week, but not this year. Thanksgiving's really late this year. So 19 November, that's the next meeting, and um, we want to do a flyaway this month. Uh, yeah, does anybody want to do a flyaway? Fly. Well, we do have Bob's airplane, and we can all get into Bob's airplane and <laughs> go someplace. He holds what? Six people? You can hold it. Well, yeah, but we got those little kids ones in the back. You can bring your we kids. Time on the wing. You can bring your kids. <laughs> I do want to make some, one, one thing before we leave. Fred had a, an operation. He spent two and a half hours on the operating table for his arm. So he, has a, a, uh, he has to have dialysis uh, every so many months uh, with his diabetes. And evidently there was a, an issue with the uh, uh, connection in his arm. So anyway, he had an operation yesterday. He's home recuperating, doing well. So I'll just bring you an update with uh, Fred. Yeah, he was doing, He was when he called this morning, he seemed to be doing really good. I mean, he, he sounded good. He sounded chipper and upbeat and all that. that. So he That doesn't sound like Fred at all. No, well, you're right. That's probably true. I think that's because the operation seemed to go well, but I, now he has to wait several weeks to find out if it was successful or not. Frogs, yeah. Well, that's probably true, David. Uh, do you have anything else to bring up? Say, we are. It's now eight o'clock. Exactly. I didn't go over. Got pizza up there. Someone. There's still some pizza. Don't forget to sign in on the sign-in sheet for those who haven't done so. Just count of sunglasses. Um. I suppose it could. Yeah.